Jenny Mack with your daily comedy news. Trevor Noah doesn't trust these at-home COVID tests. He says, we're just going to test ourselves for antigens? Is that before or after we mess up the directions on Easy Mac? It's great that the tests are finally going to be available to everyone, but 7 to 12 days? You don't think that's a little too long in a pandemic? I mean, every day is precious. Every single day is precious in a pandemic. If anyone should know that, it's Joe Biden. Kimmel, you know, Biden's original plan was you send in a bunch of cereal box tops, but that didn't work. You get four tests per house household, which is great news for people who live alone and literally no one else. Because what if you have a family of five? Do you start ranking your children? Pete Davidson is amused by Kanye West's diss track. The lyric from Kanye, God save me from that crash just so I can beat Pete Davidson's ass. A friend of Pete Davidson says Pete thinks it's totally hilarious. Not just that. He thinks the whole tabloid drama with him and Kanye and Kim is hilarious. He loves it. It's funny to him that the press wants to know his every move all of a sudden. I'll tell you what, Pete. It's been a slow week for comedy news. Believe me, I'm hoping Dave Chappelle ticks somebody off. I'm hoping George Lopez opens some more taco stands. Believe me. Hey, remember the 270 doctors that wrote the letter about Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan's advice? That story from over the weekend? The Daily Mail dug in on it. Only 87 of the signatories are medical doctors. Some of the other medical professions represented include Dr. Garvey, a veterinarian, Dr. Frost, a dentist, Dr. Avaristo, a gynecologist, a social worker, a laboratory supervisor, psychologists, teachers, engineers, and multiple podcast hosts. I did not sign the letter. Just want to be clear. One of the signatories, Ali Ward, host of the Ologies podcast, which describes itself as comedic science. <laughs> Ali Ward has no medical degree, but is a co-founder of the science communication collective Nerd Brigade. Some of the other signatories, physician's assistants, a biochemist, nearly 100 PhDs and PhD candidates, over a dozen nurses, medical students, and public health advisors. The Daily Mail wants you to know that the nearly 100 PhDs and PhD candidates largely do not practice medicine, and many are professors. Margaret Cho released a podcast, her guest, Bob Saget. This was recorded six days before Saget's death. On the podcast, Bob says... I change my comedy every seven or eight years. COVID has delayed the change a little bit, but it's also rebooted me in some ways. He repeatedly expressed his love for stand-up comedy, explaining, I love doing this damn thing. I have no reason to ever stop doing this. Why would I? The Daily Beast caught up with Moses Storm, who has a new special on HBO Max called Trash White. Moses Storm grew up well below the poverty line, traveling the country in a repurposed Greyhound bus with his parents and five siblings proselytizing, did I say that word right? Leave it in, on street corners about the end of the world. They were essentially a doomsday cult. Although Moses Storm is hesitant to use that word because cult is something that's successful, people are duped into, we had a lot of trouble getting people to sign up. There were times when he even felt legitimately jealous of the media attention paid to the Westboro Baptist Church. Whoa. He only later came to understand they are a full-on hate group. In his special, he acknowledges he doesn't look like someone who grew up poor. He says, I look like I was conceived at an Ivy League a cappella concert. Growing up, he always made his siblings laugh, but he never considered comedy as a career because he was convinced the world was going to end 46 minutes from now. I was like, well, God's going to wipe out the earth, so it doesn't matter. Vulture talked to Paul Shear about Paul Shear's worst gig ever, the one he regrets. Paul Shear says, I was performing at UCB Theater in New York when it first opened. One of the things that UCB was really good at doing was teaching us to push limits. We were going to be, for lack of a better term, a punk rock version of a comedy theater. There were shows that were set up there that were almost alienating to the audience. One of the shows was called The Sick and Twisted Sketch Show. Basically, everyone came up with their own pieces and you performed the kind of material that you normally wouldn't do that was a little bit dirty. After six or seven months, it became a competition between performers to see who could out-dirty each other. For context, this was a show I remember someone wearing a Darth Vader mask and had a plastic sex toy and started doing something with plastic sex toy to someone else's booty. I cleaned that up a little. I saw another person drinking a jug of milk and one person would punch him in the stomach and he would puke on the stage. It was next level bad choices. You couldn't even classify it as sketch comedy. Paul Shear says one of the shows was scheduled for the one year anniversary of 9-11. I was in New York during 9-11, incredibly affected by that. The show came and it was almost like, what can we do that will almost give the finger to 9-11? That was the energy. I wanted to reclaim it. 
but what I ended up doing was something in terrible taste. I played a man who was trapped under the rubble and had just gotten out, and it came out that I wasn't in the World Trade Center, but when I saw it on TV, I ran down there because I was an aspiring stand-up comic looking for TV airtime. Let me be clear here, that is the sketch character, not the actual Paul Shear. I was in a suit that was incredibly tattered, and then I was doing material, not even 9-11 material, just really terrible material while my suit was still kind of smoking. Every time I'd get nervous, I would pat myself down and ash and soot would come off me because I was covered in baby powder. With these taboo subjects, I used to revel in going the distance. When you're starting off as a comic, that's the instinct. If I say something so shocking, then it's like, F them for not liking it. It's a cheap way to rest the blame on the audience. You see it in a ton of younger comics. Then you get to watch their evolution into an adult. It's something everyone goes through in different parts of their life. We're all going to say stupid crap. We're all going to do stupid crap. And you should make those mistakes, but you need to be able to own up to them honestly. I'm very happy to have made these mistakes in a black box theater at midnight on a Saturday instead of on Instagram or Facebook because I don't want it cemented. I'm glad I was able to fail in the dark. Here's one from Conan O'Brien. Since Prince Andrew was stripped of his military titles, Britain has never been more vulnerable to attack. Yeah, Prince Andrew stripped of his titles. If you want to keep up on the royal family, whew, Harry's asking for the government to pay for security. Everyone's mad at Harry again. I love the gossip. And if you love the gossip about the royal family, boy, you should check out Palace Intrigue. It is a five-minute daily podcast about the royal family. I'm the writer on it. And that one's actually five minutes. In and out. Make fun of Harry. Make fun of Meghan. Make fun of Kate. We don't make fun of the Queen. Everyone likes the Queen. Palace Intrigue, where you get your shows. I watched How I Met Your Father. Now, let me share my experience. I hit play. And the credits came on. The credits just annoyed me. They're using the theme from How I Met Your Mother, but it's a different version of the theme. And I was like, eh, F you, How I Met Your Father. Then Kim Cattrall comes on. She is in the Bob Saget narrator role, except this time, instead of staring at the kids on the couch, we're seeing Kim Cattrall on her couch. And I hated that part. I hit pause. I was one minute, 59 seconds into the show. And I'm like, I hate this show. I can't wait to podcast about it. And the Kim Cattrall stuff is not funny. She's in the future, and she's got a future as a cow, and her house doesn't work. It's just an F you with that whole part. Then they got into the show proper. Why did I keep watching? I don't know. I was playing on my phone. It was kind of curious. Let it run. It's okay. I told the wife, I watched two episodes. I told the wife, it's watchable. It's by no means great, but I also didn't want to murder anybody after watching it. I can't tell you any of the characters' names. There's the fake Ted, who's like the main male character. He seems pretty cool. Like, I'd hang out with that guy. He's got a friend, and I think the friend owns the bar. That guy seems pretty cool. There's a British guy on it in the Barney role. British guy doesn't seem like an actual person that would exist in real life. That character does not work. They're going to have to write it differently. Uh, It just, this person doesn't exist in the real world. And then they would cut to Kim Cattrall and I would be like, do I want to murder somebody? No, I don't want to murder somebody. But I really wish this Kim Cattrall segment would end. And then it would end and I would go back to being a peaceful human being. So that's my review of How I Met Your Father. I'll sum it up by, yeah, I mean, if you had to watch it, it's not torture. Is that a good review? They did add in memory of Bob Saget to the credits of the first show. Best wishes to Louis Anderson, who is battling cancer. Louis is getting treatment at a Las Vegas hospital. The type of cancer Louis has been diagnosed with is the most common type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. While it's aggressive, it's considered potentially curable. Louis' rep says Louis is resting comfortably in his hospital bed. From Deadline, the TV adaptation of Chelsea Handler's memoir, Life Will Be the Death of Me what a hilarious title that is, has landed in development at Peacock. Chelsea Handler is set to star and executive produce the single camera project. Rolling Stone caught up with Rosebud Baker. On Rosebud's way to her first open mic in New York, she tried to calm her nerves by walking all the way downtown from her Upper East Side nanny job to Chelsea. And she took it as a good omen that she crossed paths with Joan Rivers and exchanged hellos with Joan Rivers as the comedy icon was getting into a cab. I could picture that. Hey, Joe, no, no, no. Joe just going, hey, and then getting in her car and then probably emailing me about something. Rosebud said, I had no idea how to write a joke even after about six months of doing open mics. So I thought, I got to learn how to write a joke. So I watched people's specials, David Tell, Amy Schumer, Dave Chappelle. And I transcribed the jokes by pressing the pause button after the setup, writing it down and then pressing play and writing down the punchline. 
I was literally showing myself the anatomy of a joke. And that is your comedy news for today. Follow this show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, wherever you get your shows. See you tomorrow.